Our second lesson comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, which can be found on page 158 in your pew Bibles if you would like to follow along. Let us together listen for the voice of the Lord. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. For those whom God foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son in order that He might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom God predestined, God also called. And those whom God called, God also justified. And those whom God justified, God also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? God who did not withhold His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, will God not with Him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God, God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us? From the love of Christ will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for your sake we are being killed all day long we are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered no in all these things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning I want to give you a little peek behind the curtain of worship and sermon preparation. My colleagues just got a little bit nervous. Preparation for Sunday morning begins months in advance. Doing so allows us to see themes well ahead of time and gives us a narrative arc to follow. Me, Karen, John, Marco, the soloists, the worship arts team, the choirs, the instrumentalists, think about the themes, pray about them, and develop visual representations, musical pieces, prayers, and on and on. And to aid in this work, at Northminster, we follow what is called the Revised Common Lectionary. The lectionary is built around the seasons of the church year and includes at least four readings every Sunday. These readings come from the Hebrew Bible, the Psalms, the Epistles, and the Gospels. It's a really helpful tool, and it can even be something you can use for personal Bible study. Some Sundays, the readings are short and to the point. On other Sundays, the texts are long and meandering, kind of like sermons. Sometimes, the themes from the text jump off the page and beg to be addressed. Other times, the readings come from selections where we are left wondering, what in the world are we supposed to do with that? Someone has a really wicked sense of humor. On those Sundays, it's not unusual for us to conveniently be inspired to go off lectionary. Hey, listen, inspiration comes in many shapes and sizes. Then there are Sundays like today. Sundays when we are presented with a text so rich, so full of ideas and themes and materials and jumping off points that it is nearly impossible to choose which one direction to go. Romans 8 is a transition point in Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And as such, it is where the Apostle Paul wraps up 
all he has been addressing in order to move on to his next major thesis in the letter. And friends, it is no secret, Paul rambles. In fact, right before one of his major speeches recorded in the book of Acts, the author of that text tells us that the crowd said of Paul, what does this babbler want to say? It's true. Paul can jam more into one well-crafted run-on sentence than most figures in history. And in these 14 verses, 17 sentences, in some 323 words, yes, I counted, in the New Revised Standard Translation of the Bible, Paul says a lot. And as a result, this lectionary reading packs a punch. Even someone who is relatively unfamiliar with the flow of the entire letter to the church in Rome, or even chapter 8 by itself, likely recognizes many of the verses and may have committed some of them to memory. So after all of this, we are left pondering this question. Where do we start? Well, at the risk of making the most obvious statement of all time, I propose we start right here. Life is hard. We do not need experts to affirm that this is true. We live it every day. The news and our own life experiences regularly remind us of this axiom. And this struggle is not just ours, even though it may seem as if we are alone. Each and every one of us read and hear the narratives over and over again in the headlines and within our own hearts and minds. Narratives that tell us that there is so much to fear. That disaster is just around the corner. That life is a series of horrible mishaps. That somehow we are inadequate. That we will never measure up. And perhaps most potently, that somehow these are all evidence that we have lost favor with God. Or that God is absent. And it is easy to convince ourselves that it is so. It's right here, in this mess, where Paul meets his first century readers. Romans was written into a setting that was full of despair and reasons to be afraid. Different, but also not completely unlike our own. Life expectancy was short. Infant mortality rates were high. Hunger and famine were widespread. Most people lived day to day, just struggling to survive. The empire occupied most of the known world. The mythical peace of Rome was established by and maintained through the point of a sword and at the oppressive might of an army. There was persecution at the hands of those in power. Life was hard. Struggles and hardships such as this did not go unnoticed, nor were they summarily dismissed in this passage. To the contrary, they are its backdrop. And the beautiful, hopeful, and deeply challenging words that we find at the end of Romans 8 come out of this study and speak directly into our own. They are words that led theologian and author N.T. Wright to pen the end of Romans 8 deserves to be written in letters of fire on the living tablets of our hearts. So with this as our frame, and out of the many different directions one could go with this passage, there are a few things that I would like for us to focus on this morning. First, Paul reminds his readers that even though we feel as though we are left alone, to struggle, it is there that the Spirit intercedes, where words likely fail us. At those moments when we simply do not know what to say, there are sighs too deep for words being uttered on our behalf. The searcher of the heart, 
understands the groanings of our spirit when we have no words. And let's be honest, how often do we find ourselves tongue-tied in the face of our own despair or within our most difficult of circumstances? It is comforting and transformative to know that communication does not cease with the divine when we find ourselves at a loss for words. Somehow within the silence, our spirit groans, constantly communing with the one that is closer than our very breath. You are likely doing it right now. And as as comforting as that is, Paul doesn't stop there. For immediately following this is the verse we know as Romans 8.28. It is a verse that has likely become a favorite to many. However, it's also a verse that does not say what many would like for it to say. You see, Paul does not write that all things happen that are good for those who love God. Wouldn't it be great if it were so? If if we could avoid difficulty or if everything would just work out perfectly magically turn out right if we just somehow faced hard enough or believed right enough? Wouldn't it be great? But we know that we've suffered far too many setbacks and hardships and too much loss to believe that somehow they are blessings in disguise. The pain is far too real. To think that God might somehow be manipulating our experiences or causing us to go through them just to teach us some cosmic lesson is unbearable. Who can believe in a God like that? When we stop to actually consider that kind of message, we know that it's it's not true. And it's, it's not even what the passage says. There's a real danger when We only hear part of the overall narrative of Scripture, and this is one snippet that has been made to say many things that it doesn't say, so many damaging and destructive things. But friends, it does say something beautiful. N.T. Wright says this, we can be completely sure that God is in charge. That God can bring good out of whatever happens. Verse 28 is a much-loved promise for many who have learned by it to trust God in the many varied and often troubling circumstances of our lives. The world is still groaning and we with it. But God is with us in this groaning. And this God is at work. Right here in the mess. At work, right here with us. In the midst. Life is hard. The God of redemption, the searcher of our hearts, is at work for beauty, for justice, for mercy, for good, through and within our every circumstance. And this amazing passage doesn't even end there. Paul continues as if he can hear the qualifying questions and hopeless sentiments of his overwhelmed audience before these things were ever uttered. But there's so much pain in life, Paul. There are so many setbacks. Where is God? And how can I be worthy of love, grace, and mercy? You don't know me. To these questions and all of the other inquiries that rest in our own hearts attempting to sell us a narrative contrary to the narrative of the gospel, Paul asks questions of his own. Questions rooted in the character and nature of God. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? He asks. Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, says the apostle. In fact, because of the activity of God, because of the love of the divine, 
we are found, along with all the saints, to be more than conquerors over anything that life may throw at us. Even that which threatens our very existence. Paul Ackmeyer wrote, Gone forever is the temptation to assume ill fortune is evidence of God's rejection of us. Banished once and for all is the temptation to conclude that when things go badly, it means that God has deserted us. God is for us. Nothing can therefore be against us. And then with a flourish, Paul brings this portion of his letter to the church in Rome to a climactic end. Again, he appears to hear the thoughts bouncing in the heads of the readers, preparing to spill out of our own lips. But what about the oppressors, Paul? What about the powers that be? What about the bad decisions that rest in my past and the uncertainty of our future together? What about the forces we can't see that are attempting to destroy us? And, and what about the ones that we can see that threaten our very well-being? Yes, Paul, what about all of these things and more? Are they not a threat to ultimately separate us from the love of God? Are they not evidence of God's absence? Theologian and professor Nick Carter wrote of Romans 8. Its message is that misfortunes do not provide any evidence that God has abandoned us. And suffering is not God's final word. Yes, evil exists, but it will be overcome. It is the Christian confession that in the midst of such tragedies and the ensuing challenges they bring, not even the evil associated with these events can separate us from God's love. There is nothing in all of creation, not circumstance, not powers from without or thoughts from within, not the strength of our own voice, not our own struggles to believe that can ultimately sever us from the love of God found in Jesus the Christ. Not one thing or even all of them. This is the narrative into which we are called to live. Friends, this is the good news. Life is hard. The God of redemption, the searcher of our hearts, is at work for beauty, for justice, for mercy, for good, through and within our every circumstance, and nothing, nothing can ever separate us from the love of such a God. Not one thing or even all of them together. This is the hope of our faith. This is the narrative that changes everything. And now, now it is up to us to live together as if it is true. To God be the glory. Amen.